Hello, my gentle and of course very modern apes. My name is Erica, or Gutsy Gibbon, and this is my part for this year's Paleo Rewind. The Paleo Rewind is exactly what it sounds like. The folks who were involved in this cool event that's put on by Edge from the Edge channel pick a month and then cover the cool paleontological discoveries that came to light during that time period. I picked April before I actually looked at what discoveries were spread out amongst which months in this past year, and April is bereft of hominin news. So you're gonna get to hear me talk about non-hominin paleontology. We'll see how that goes. And not only that, but as an additional challenge, we need to keep this below 15 minutes. Truly a daunting task. First on our list for April is a cool new transitional form found for the evolution of prokaryotes to eukaryotes. In a new paper titled Structure and Dynamics of Odonarchaeota Tubulin and the Implications for Eukaryotic Microtubule Evolution, Kaner and colleagues found a crucial missing link in the evolution of eukaryotes from a prokaryotic ancestor. Tubules are intracellular structures that help organize the guts of a cell. Prokaryotic tubules are starkly different from eukaryotic tubules, and if you try to genetically alter the eukaryotic tubules into the prokaryotic tubules, you get catastrophic disassembly, which is bad. So how do you get the evolution of the eukaryotic condition from the prokaryotic condition? This is what they sought to figure out. And to investigate this evolutionary transition, the researchers chose to look at the closest prokaryotic relative alive today to eukaryotic organisms, this being the Asgard archaea. Specifically, they're looking at an archaea called Odonarchaeota, which is a hydrothermally living critter. In the abstract, they note that the GTP-bound structure within Odonarchaeota resembles a microtubule protofilament with the GTP bound between subunits coordinating the plus N subunit through a network of water-bound molecules and unexpectedly by two cations. A water molecule is located suitable for GTP hydrolysis. Time course, crystallography, and electron microscopy, which is how they sort of investigated the nature of the internal structures of these critters, revealed the conformational changes to GTP hydrolysis. Odin tubulin forms tubules at high temperatures with short curved protofilaments coiling around the tubule circumference, more similar to FTSZ rather than running parallel to its length as in microtubules. Thus, Odin tubulin represents an evolutionary stage intermediate between prokaryotic FTSZ and eukaryotic microtubule forming tubulins. So what on earth does all of that mean since most of us here focus on macroscopic organisms rather than microbiology? Well, what they're saying is actually pretty simple. They're saying that these Odin archaeota have these microtubule protofilaments, which is more similar to eukaryotic cells. However, the formation of these protofilaments, the sort of structure that they take, is more similar to prokaryotes, suggesting that what we have here is a transitional form, as it were, between the prokaryotic and eukaryotic condition that doesn't result in the deconstruction of the cell. And so long story short, we can check off another box in charting the evolution of prokaryotes to eukaryotes, which is of course a good thing. Next on the list for April is the discovery of a new theropod trackway that shows a pathologic foot. Herrera Castillo and colleagues published a paper titled A Theropod Trackway Providing Evidence of a Pathological Foot from the Exceptional Locality of Las Hoyas. This one is a lot more straightforward than the last paper. They describe a trackway occurring in laminated carbonated limestones of the Las Hoyas locality in Spain. It is unmistakably a large theropod dinosaur trackway encompassing two unusual aspects, namely wide steps and a set of equally deformed left footprints with a dislocated digit. They talk about the other critters that are found sort of in this trackway in the ancient ecosystem, and conclude with all results mutually support the hypothesis that a large theropod dinosaur with a pathological foot generated the trackway as it is crossed an area of shallow water while slowly walking towards the main water source, thus stepping steadily over the benthonic mat over which multiple fish were swimming. And that's super cool, right? What we have is a theropod dinosaur that is enormous in size that has managed to survive having a pathologic condition in its foot, a dislocated digit. And it's just kind of meandering in this ancient ecosystem. We've got this snapshot of a, of a poor theropod with a hurt foot making its way towards a waterhole. 
I love papers that systematically ground dinosaurs in reality. Not to say that they aren't already grounded in reality, but people tend to look at dinosaurs and think of them in sort of this far-flung time that's almost mythological. But these were animals. These were large animals that lived in interdependent ecosystems, just like the organisms we share the world with today. And so, like the animals that live today, they got in fights, they got hurt, or they twisted their ankles while chasing down prey, and they had to live with these injuries just like a lion might. In the case of this theropod dinosaur, we have a dislocated digit, which would have undoubtedly impacted its ability to hunt. What happened after it laid down this trackway? Did it survive into old age, or did it die shortly after of starvation or of some other accrued injury? I just think it's really cool to remember that dinosaurs, as majestic and awesome as they were, were animals that lived and died just like anything on the planet at any given moment. The next paper is also thankfully fairly simple. Uh, we discovered a new basal ichthyosauromorph. Wren and colleagues published a paper titled A New Basal Ichthyosauromorph from the Lower Triassic of Zibao Guangxi Autonomous Region in South China. So the abstract tells us what we have. They describe a newly discovered basal ichthyosauromorph, so this means that it's an animal that looks like it's going to potentially give rise or have a connection to the ichthyosaurs that come later from the Lower Triassic. So this is really, really early. It's called Basosaurus or Bicesaurus robustus, the only known specimen of this new species, so they only found one of them. And what they have is a partial skeleton comprised of ribs, gastralia, a limb element, 12 centra, and seven neural arches. So then they want to compare what they have to other known ichthyosauromorphs or ichthyosaurs and other sort of marine reptiles of the time period to see if it truly does deserve uh, its own species, right? To make sure that it's actually distinct from everything else. And the features that they determine to be unique is that its neural arches lack transverse processes, the dorsal ribs are slender and not pachystoic even on the proximal end, the median gastral elements have sharp interior processes, the limb element is long, so they're saying this is most likely the radius, they're saying it's large, it's, <laughs> it's got a length that's larger than three meters, which is big for that time period, more in line with the larger ichthyosaurus that come later, and it shares no orthomorphological features with Utatsusaurus hatai, particularly with regard to body size, the morphology of the probable radius. Uh, Bicesaurus also represents the first record of an early Triassic ichthyosauromorph from the Guanxi Autonomous Region, extending the known geographic distribution of ichthyosauromorphs in southern China. I'm really glad they have this figure here, figure two, because to me, I look at <laughs> I look at the left side here, and I'm like, oh, it's it's a bunch of ribs and some vertebra because I know primates and really mammals in general, not reptiles, especially not marine reptiles, um, which is cool that they've done this sort of color-coded version to show us what's what with the limb elements representing L. So they're saying this sort of neon green structure here is a radius. Radii look really different in reptiles versus in mammals. So I'm just gonna take their word for it. Obviously DV are our vertebral elements. We have R here, which is the ribs and the gastralia are here in G. And it's a really beautiful fossil. When you look at it sort of spread out here, they've labeled all of the elements, which is super helpful, I'm sure, to folks who are really more versed in ichthyosauromorphs than I am. But they've done a very comprehensive job, I'd say, making the case that this critter is indeed unique. And if it truly is a basal ichthyosauromorph, it's just another step in figuring out the evolution of these very enigmatic animals and why perhaps they were successful for so long. The last two papers might be a reach for a Paleo Rewind, but I had to get something at least hominin and primate adjacent. And so the next paper we're talking about is the zoonotic origin of human malaria from an ape malaria ancestor. Plenderleith et al. published Zoonotic Origin of the Human Malaria Parasite Plasmodium Malariae from African Apes. So what they've done here is they've utilized a novel genetic approach to the sequences of various different malaria species in order to figure out basically how they're related to one another. They say the human parasite Plasmodium malariae has relatives infecting African apes and New World monkeys, but the origins remain unknown. Using a novel approach to characterize Plasmodium malariae-related species in wild and captive African apes, we found that this group comprises three distinct lineages, 
one of which represents a previously unknown, highly divergent species infecting chimps, bonobos, and gorillas across Central Africa, and a second ape-derived lineage is much more closely related to the third human-infective lineage, but exhibits little evidence of genetic exchange with it, so likely represents a separate species. Moreover, they say the levels and nature of genetic polymorphisms in Plasmodium malariae indicate that it resulted from the zoonotic transmission of an African ape parasite, reminiscent of the origin of Plasmodium falciparum. This is a different type of malaria. In contrast, Plasmodium brasilianum falls within the radiation of human Plasmodium malariae and thus reflects a recent anthropognosis. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that the human malarial parasite, the human specific, I guess I should say, malarial parasite comes from a more basal version that infected other African apes. It is notable that this happened recently and the paper argues that it's like in the past 50,000 years. And they even argue very slightly that this may have had something to do with the origin of agriculture. So that had to be what eventually spurred the speciation of the human specific malaria parasite from the other apes which is cool and interesting. But I actually think the coolest part of this is the fact that the New World monkey malaria, Plasmodium brasilianum, actually descends from the human malarial parasite, Plasmodium malariae. So they call this anthroponosis, which is the opposite of zoonosis. So zoonosis is when humans can um, contract a parasite or a, a disease from animals, like it jumps from other animals into humans and can now infect us. This is the opposite. This is a human version jumping into another species. So anthroponosis occurred with New World monkeys. So basically humans came and populated North and South America, and then our version of malaria adapted so that it could infect New World monkeys, which is of course our, pl our closest living relative here on these two continents. Apologize to your local platyrines, please. And the last paper I want to go over involves chimpanzees and some implications they might have towards hominin evolution. Although that might be a bit of a stretch, I just want to talk about it because it's cool. Goncalves and colleagues published Staring Death in the Face, Chimpanzees' Attention Toward Conspecific Skulls and the Implications of a Face Module Guiding Their Behavior. So chimpanzees do some weird and interesting stuff with their dead. They do what we would ostensibly call mourning. And so these guys wanted to see if they recognized chimpanzee skulls and preferentially paid them more attention as opposed to other species skulls, amongst other tests. So here they say, we tested chimpanzees' visual attention to images of conspecific, so members of the same species or group, and non-conspecific stimuli. So they compared a chimpanzee skull to a dog, a cat and a rat skull, as well as their faces, as well as what they call skull-shaped stones. Additionally, we compared their visual attention towards chimpanzee-only stimuli. So what did chimpanzees prefer to look at when shown a picture of a chimp face, a chimp skull, and a chimp skull-shaped stone? Lastly, we tested their attention towards specific regions of the chimpanzee skulls. So when you show them a picture of a chimpanzee skull on a screen, where do they look? So they theorized that they would obviously prefer chimpanzees, and overall, supporting their hypothesis, the chimpanzees preferred conspecific related stimuli. So when shown pictures of a cat, a dog, a rat, and a chimp face, skull, or skull-shaped stone, they always preferred the one that looked like chimpanzees or the most like chimpanzees. Which is super interesting that they seem to recognize that a chimpanzee skull is more similar to them than a dog, a cat, or rat skull. And they even did this with the skull-shaped stones. So they preferred vaguely chimp-like visages as opposed to other animals. Um, and they finished by sort of saying, we suggest the chimpanzee skulls retain relevant face-like features that arguably activate a domain-specific face module in chimpanzees' brains, guiding their attention. So like humans, they like things that look like them. And I think that's really cool just in and of itself. So here's a picture of one of the test subjects, Ayumu, prefer, or performing the eye tracking session in the experimental booth. So they're tracking, first of all, what they look at and then what specifically on the image are they looking at? And they note this in the abstract, I didn't touch on it immediately then, but they prefer looking at the teeth, which is interesting, not the eyes. Um, here's the picture of what they were showing them, the faces facing diagonally and forward. And another thing the abstract noted that I, I sort of skipped over is that they preferred forward-facing skulls and images. So they liked being looked at head-on, which is cool. 
And the reason that I said this might have implications for hominin evolution is because very clearly there is a point in time, and it's really around late genus homo, that we start seeing preferential treatment of the dead, right? So burials for one, but additionally uh, adornment of the dead while they're being buried. Things like Neanderthals putting red ochre on the body and putting flowers on the body, stashing them in specific cases, as we've potentially seen with Homo naledi, a much more basal hominin with a 600 cc brain case size that's half that of humans. And to me what this suggests is that the recognition of the dead as a member of one's own group is of course a precursor to preferentially treating them after death. And this seems to be present in chimpanzees, which are typically argued to be more close to the Miocene ape condition, so the ancestral condition of both of us. So what the point is of all of this is that it seems as if our recognition of members of our own group, one persists after death, and two is very old. So my gentle and of course very modern apes, that's what I have for you for April with regard to the Paleo Rewind. Perhaps next year, if I'm invited back, I'll pick a better month that's more relevant to hominins in my area of expertise. But what I will say is that it was really cool getting to comb through all of the paleontologically relevant papers uh, in that month. So good luck to the rest of the members of the Paleo Rewind. I look forward to watching each and every one of your videos. And in the meantime, guys, do take care of yourselves.